morning, everyone. Um, thanks very much for attending this webinar. Um, when we tried to figure out what people might be interested in, uh, we sort of gaze the crystal ball and have a think about what might be coming up. And certainly when we thought about running this session, uh, we were aware that the, the Bell case was likely to be completed in the appeal courts in September. So I thought this would be about the right time. And happily that's proved to be correct. Um, but obviously what we've also had is the uh, announcement of the rollout of the vaccine programme for COVID-19 for 12 to 15 year olds. So I think in a way this session is quite timely. Um, that's reflected in as well in the uh, take up. And what I was going to mention was that we um, had to uh, limit the numbers attending. And so there is going to be a rerun um, with, with added jokes, hopefully, um, next February. Um, and, and I think that's about the 8th, Jess, isn't it? So if you've got colleagues who uh, um, uh, couldn't uh, get a, get a, a, an appointment for this particular one, then they should be fine for that one. And, and I'm sure Jess will correct me if I'm wrong about that later on. Anyway, um, as I say, thanks very much for attending. Um, as Jess said, my name is John Holmes. Um, I'm uh, a partner in the advisory team at Hempson's in London. Um, I suppose I'll forget if I don't mention it now, but I should make a declaration of interest. Um, because in relation to the Bell case, uh, we were acting for the two intervening trusts, and I'll explain their role in the saga a bit later on. Um, and obviously, I've tried to be neutral and 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 uh, 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 considered uh, in what I say, but inevitably, I suppose I'm going to be slightly biased about some things, so you have to take that as read. Um, if you have questions about that or about any aspect at the end, then obviously you'll you'll ask those through the chat box function, as just mentioned. Good. So um, in terms of what we're going to cover in this session, um, um, I have done a couple of uh, uh, practice sessions and I've, so I have frankly no idea how long this will take, but it'd be about half an hour, hopefully. Um, so there should be plenty of time for questions later on. Um, the first thing I want to look at is why this is an important subject. Um, and here I think that it's sort of goes without saying that it's crucial that in treating children, we're clear on how to seek consent. It can't, it can't uh, I think that the, the what? huge publicity uh, yeah. about both the Bell case and also the rollout of vaccine for children yeah, shows there's huge interest in this area. Yeah. Um, getting a few noises off, um, oh. so it may be that can I just remind everyone about muting themselves if they could please. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, um, so to carry on just in terms of the overview then, the plan is to first of all roll back the years to 1985 uh, and to look at Gillick again um, and then I want to look at the effect of Bell uh, and particularly in where it leaves us in relation to Gillick. I'm going to touch on the COVID vaccinations for children and I put the I think when I sent out the program for this I put on problem areas in relation to children's consent I doubt we'll have time for that to be honest but if you have particular questions fire away and I'll do my best. Um, in relation to Gillick the things I want to look at particularly are is it still good law? How is it applied? Who decides? Where does parental consent fit in? Uh, to all of that. Uh, what about the future? And, and I think the other thing I want to try to do this morning is to try to, um, as an explainer, just, to, just to, to deal with the succession of judgments and decisions we've had in relation to the Bell case, um, just so that you have a better understanding of sort of how it's evolved and, and where we've reached. So that's the plan of campaign. So we think uh, this is where we should have, if it was a film, we'd have one of those calendar, desk calendars and all the pages would be blowing away one after the other, all the way back to 1985 um, and the Gillett case, uh, which seem, it doesn't seem like a long time ago. It really is a long time ago. Um, one of the things that's amazing when you go back and read through the decision is how basically uh, when it came to the Court of Appeal, when it came to the House of Lords rather, um, how much they were struck by how little precedent there was prior to Gillick about what the ability of, of uh, 16 um, of, of girls or children under 16 was to um, agree and consent to medical treatment. And I'll come on to that in a second. Uh, again, one of the extraordinary things when you read through it is how much they looked at what was frankly sort of Victorian case law, which seems to involve um, slightly amazing scenarios about how it's perfectly OK for fathers to refuse their wives to see their children and so on, you know, and using that as a guide in the 1980s as to um, what 
children should be allowed to consent to um, was obviously something the court struggled with. Just to recap, um, what happened here was that there was a, um, a national guidance about how um, uh, contraception could be prescribed to girls under 16 um, using their own consent if they refused to involve their parents. Mrs Gillick, who had a large family, including a number of daughters um, living in Norfolk, uh, didn't like this at all um, and wrote to her local area health authority asking them to confirm that they wouldn't offer uh, this to her children. They refused and um, the case started. Um, I've mentioned on the slide here that it's hugely controversial at the time. Um, and what happened was that in the usual sort of knockabout way, the judge at first instance said no. The appeal court said actually no, we're going to allow the appeal and strike down the guidance. And then the House of Lords weighed in and said no, we find that the policy is actually lawful. Um, it, it's interesting um, that although uh, Mrs Gillick had children very much in that age group at the time, this was very much a test case with her as a vehicle. Um, and this was all before crowdfunding and believe it or not, before the internet. Um, so it's extraordinary how these things could still happen and how they were put together um, yeah, even in those times before we have a um, more enlightened view. So, um, so that's Gillick. What did it decide? Um, the lead judgment is Lord Fraser. Uh, and as I say, he wasn't very impressed with those Victorian cases about um, uh, villains denying their, their, their wives access to children. And he, in his tone in the quote I put here, and the, and the emphasis is mine, I should add, his tone here is almost mocking. He says, it seems so surprising that I can't accept it in the absence of clear provisions to that effect. It'd be verging on the absurd to suggest that a girl of boy age 15 can't consent, for example, to have a medical examination or to have a broken arm set. So he's 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 very clear, isn't he? And and he's basing that on his own view about things, not on previous cases particularly, but rather that it's self-evident that that's the case. Um, the second quote I've included here um, is a bit more chunky. And what's interesting here is how we move from parental responsibility, if you like, to talking about parental control. He says that in his view, it's contrary to the ordinary experience of mankind, which is not a phrase you kind of see trumped around in judgment very often, to say that a child or a young person remains in fact under the complete control of his parents until he attains the, uh, the age of 18. And that uh, on attaining that age, he suddenly acquires independence. He talks about parents relaxing their control gradually. Um, moreover, the degree of parental control actually exercised a particular child does in practice very considerably according to his understanding and intelligence. And it would, in my opinion, be unrealistic for the court not to recognise these facts. And the bit I've put in highlights at the end, social customs change and the law ought to, and does in fact have regard to such changes when they're of major importance. So he's very much saying we're living in a different age um, and we need to start again in terms of what the situation is. Um, what I would take from that is that it's interesting how the focus is on control here and how the law is seeing uh, is reflecting on a gradual process of achieving autonomy on the part of children that obviously is then reflected in the test that was brought in. Uh, later cases have commented um, that parents have this responsibility as part of their duty to protect the child and promote their welfare. So if you like, it's not something there for the benefit of the parent, it's there for the benefit of the child. So um, what did the Gillick case actually decide? And I've put here the, the Fraser, the famous Fraser guidelines on contraception. Um, I, I do know that for, for a long time there was this issue about whether you could even mention Mrs Gillick in relation to this test. And certainly I've read something recently suggesting that she, she doesn't actually mind um, and that it's all a bit of a myth. So um, either way, I don't think you can get around the fact that her name is on the case report. So I think, you know, to a certain extent, you know, you've, once you're into this territory, this is where you are. Anyway, um, so what, what did the phrase guidelines decide? Um, it says the doctor will be justified in proceeding without the parent's consent or even knowledge, provided he is satisfied. And, and I pause there again to mention that's my, my bold lettering there. It's very clear, isn't it, that the emphasis is on the doctor's assessment. The person providing the treatment has to make the assessment. It's not a question of um, uh, checking what other people think. It's not a question of, of going out and seeking a judge's agreement. It's a question of doing an assessment, a factual assessment there and then. And what does the uh, the doctor need to be satisfied on? 
And, and here are the components that the girl, although under 16 years of age, will understand his advice. That he can't persuade them to inform their parents or inform uh, or allow him to inform the parents that, that she's seeking contraceptive advice. That she's very likely to begin or continue to have sexual intercourse with or without contraceptive treatment. Unless they receive that treatment, uh, their health is likely to suffer and that their best interests require them to have contraceptive advice treatment, both without parental consent. So as I say, the, the things I would highlight here is first of all, who is making that decision, which is very much um, about the, uh, the person who's providing the treatment. But secondly, that if you look at this and take a step back and look at it, it's very much couched in terms of harm reduction. If you don't do this, then the outcome is going to be worse for the child. So therefore it's in the child's best interest to go ahead on the basis of their consent, provided they can understand and, and make that decision. So um, if we look at the, if we take those Fraser guidelines, what's happened is that those have been applied broadly to under 16s across a range of different treatments. Um, uh, so that they can provide their own consent when they have sufficient maturity and understanding. So if you like, in contrast to uh, something like the Mental Capacity Act, which looks at a snapshot, here you're looking at uh, uh, what could be seen as a developmental issue. How's the child developing? What is their level of understanding? Um, and also in contrast to, to looking at uh, doing Mental Capacity Act assessments in relation to adults, uh, we're not dealing here with an underlying mental disorder. So one of the issues that came bubbling up in the Bell case was about how you have to be cautious about reading mental case, mental capacity act case law across into cases involving children. I've included here a quote from the uh, the current GMC guidance on seeking consent in relation to uh, 0 to 18 year olds that provides that you must decide whether a young person is able to understand the nature, purpose and possible consequences. So again, this is very much reflecting, isn't it, that test that we just looked at in the Fraser guidelines about the person providing the treatment, making an assessment on the spot as to whether that child is mature enough and has sufficient understanding to make that decision. I, I've put on the slide here at the bottom, um, not to forget the Family Law Reform Act 1969, which effectively means that 16 and 17 year olds are in a special position um, on the basis that the law for consent purposes treats them as though they're adults. And we'll come on to um, the odd effects that has in relation to Bell um, in a second. Again, government health warning, that doesn't mean the 16, 17 year olds are always able to refuse to treatment that's in their best interests. And we'll deal with that again um, in, in a, one of the later slides. So um, we fast forward 35 or maybe even 36 years. Um, I, 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 I can manage that um, to um, the Bell case um, and um, I've included here uh, one of the many 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 headlines um, that we saw um, in relation to this. Um, just to recap in terms of uh, Kira Bell's own circumstances um, she was born female uh, and at the age of 17 uh, was prescribed puberty blockers with a view to, uh, to later treatment which she went ahead with um, and later on, she had regrets and criticised the whole process by which she'd been treated. Uh, and you probably can't see it in that slide, but one of the things in there that she says is that she wanted to take action um, to protect other children who, in her words, it would be better if they simply were, 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 were left um, to, to make their mind up over a much longer period rather than being prescribed um, um, hormone blockers to arrest their uh, puberty development. Uh, and prevent them developing secondary sexual characteristics. So if you like, that was her take on things. So um, in, in terms of the um, the circumstances of Bell and Tavistock, uh, again, this is, there's been quite a lot of publicity about this. This is probably all stuff that you're aware of. Um, I've mentioned here that it started in, in 2019 with um, pre-action correspondence and, and I check things and I think the act case was actually started at the beginning of 2020. Um, uh, that was when things started. As I say, uh, we were looking after the interests of the two uh, trusts that provided uh, endocrinological, endocrinological treatment um, to children who were referred across from the Tavistock. That's the UCLH and Leeds Teaching Trust. Um, 
So as I say, um, again, a very controversial issue. Our under 16 is capable of giving consent to prescription of hormone blocker treatment um, for gender dysphoria. Um, the claimants argued that the lifelong consequences of treatment for gender dysphoria were so far reaching that under 16s were incapable of the required level of insight and understanding. And that essentially was the case. Um, it's worth mentioning that the, the, the team practice at the gender dysphoria um, uh, uh, specialist serviced um, was always to obtain the child's consent and not rely upon parental consent. And the reason for that was that the view was always that um, gender is so central to an individual identity that it should only be done with the consent of a Gillick competent child. Uh, and the uh, case reports uh, deal with the fact there's lots of evidence about the processes used both at Tavistock but also at the two other trusts um, where the medication was actually provided. Um, so that essentially, essentially was the, uh, the battle lines for this case. We move on then to um, the first instance outcome. It was a claim for judicial review um, and went to the divisional court and quite a strong divisional court sat with, with three judges, which is fairly unusual. Um, the starting point is to say that the claim of illegality on the part of the defendants failed. It had been suggested that policies and procedures um, were illegal as it's not possible for under 16 to provide informed consent um, and that element of the case failed. So, so far so good. Um, however, there was a sting in the tail, which is that the court gave a judgment was set out which went on to basically give what it described as guidance um, about what was needed for effective consent. Um, excuse me one second. That, that came in two parts. Um, the first part was, if you like, a data set of the things that you would need to understand and appreciate before you could give consent. And the second part of that were indications about certain age ranges. And uh, just to, to, to broadly um, uh, describe these, what the court said was that it thought it was highly unlikely that children who were 13 and younger uh, would ever be Gillick competent. It thought it was doubtful that 14 and 15 year olds could. And in relation to 16 year olds who you remember are treated as adults for consent purposes, um, it's, they still went on and said it may be better to get the court involved if you weren't entirely sure. So um, the effect of that, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate, was that um, it came as a seismic shock really um, to the whole patient group and to those who are providing treatment and had a huge effect on current patients. Um, in order to try to ameliorate that effect, what happened was there was an application to the High Court for a stay on the effects of the, um, uh, the decision um, pending an appeal, uh, which was started straight away, uh, and that stay was granted. So, so what that, the idea of that was that the uh, distress and physical harm that could be caused to somebody who stopped midway through treatment because of problems with consent um, what, what, what would be extraordinary and therefore the court agreed that effectively you could carry on treating those who are currently in treatment um, but obviously what that didn't do was to help anyone who was still about to start treatment or was waiting for an assessment and we'll come on to what happened in relation to that next. So, so just to recap then um, what happens is that in the divisional court um, the court is basically doesn't uphold the claim but gives a, an extensive judgment about what's needed for um, Gillick competence. And you can see that um, what's been fed into this um, is, if you like, a lot of the sort of thoughts, particularly in relation to the data set you need to uh, understand, uh, that come from Mental Capacity Act type cases about all sorts of issues, such as um, uh, people without capacity's ability to uh, access social media, what they need to understand in order to change residence, so on and so on. OK, and then before we come on to the Court of Appeal, I want to deal with the issue of uh, parental consent. So where does this fit? Um, it had been raised as an issue in the Divisional Court as a potentially alternative way of providing consent um, if there was a problem with uh, getting the child's um, uh, consent on a Gillick basis. Um, but that hadn't been taken any further. Um, so the thought was, well, in the period waiting for the hearing of appeal, uh, which could have been up to a year potentially. Um, a number of people um, thought, well, perhaps what we could do is to instead go ahead and start treatment or maybe even continue treatment based on parental consent and use that as a legal basis to provide treatment. 
was that possible um, in a situation where you potentially had a child who um, it was felt needed consent and the parents were in favour of it. So we had um, another, effectively another test case uh, come out of that group uh, called AB versus CD. Um, what that involved uh, was a child who was born as a, as a boy had um, uh, uh, come out as, as, as uh, trans at age 10 uh, and by the time of the court case was 15, uh, been living as a girl for some time, had actually started uh, puberty blockers in 2019. Um, but the reason it was brought forward as an issue was there were doubts about continued prescription, particularly because GPs uh, weren't always um, uh, keen to, to get involved in all these issues. Um, and so um, the application was uh, brought forward, I think in January uh, of uh, this year, uh, and decided in March. Um, what's interesting is that the decision was that uh, parental consent could be used uh, to uh, provide a legal basis for treatment. And in fact, that can exist alongside Gillick competence on the part of a child, provided it doesn't go against the child's wishes. So we have a sort of odd situation where, um, although if you read the Gillick judgment, it sounds a bit like as the child's ability to consent grows, the parent's ability to consent falls away. In fact, it can still exist alongside what's been called concurrent consent. You might be thinking, well, where on earth is this actually, where could this be used apart from the very odd circumstances like this, where you've got a judgment that seems to block off Gillick competence. Um, and that, that obviously is going to be a very rare occurrence. Well, the judge herself who gave the decision in this case said that, well, you could have a situation where potentially um, a child is Gillick competent but is incapacitated to make that decision or you could have a situation where a child is Gillick competent and perhaps just overwhelmed by the decision and can't make it. So if you like it's providing a safety net that parental consent can still be used certainly in the case of 15 year old in this situation. Um, the second bit of this case which is really important is that there was a decision that um, giving consent to um, provide puberty blockers isn't a treatment uh, that is so special that it always requires a court order first. And you remember there's been a lot of litigation about this in recent years. Generally speaking, the court has backed off from wanting to get involved unless there's actual opposition to treatment. Um, and here what the court said was that this shouldn't be regarded as one of those special cases where you need to go off and get a judge to sign off a treatment if the parents are providing um, consent. And the justification for that was very much in terms of the fact that there is a regulatory framework to protect children and that those involved in assessing uh, capacity, uh, taking consent and, and providing treatment will be very much subject to that regulatory framework, whether it's through the GMC, the CQC and so on. So if you like, the thought was, well, why do we need the court to get involved if there are all these other uh, safety nets there to prevent problems? Um, so this is why parental consent has, has arisen as an issue and, and generally speaking, I think from the from the trust perspective, this was felt to be a helpful way um, of allowing a route to consent whilst we waited to see what the appeal court would do with the appeal. So um, on to the appeal itself. Um, as you will know, uh, the appeal against the divisional court's uh, judgment was successful. Um, the divisional court's guidance was overturned. Um, if you read the appeal court's judgment, um, it, it's more about the powers of the court on a judicial review um, and the elephant trap of making policy based on contested expert evidence in the judicial review, rather than about Gillick and Gillick competence. But it is very clear that the judges um, don't see there's any real difficulty with uh, with Gillick. Uh, and so it's very supportive of that decision and of the um, of the way um, that, that particular a case has been interpreted. Um, the court was critical of the use of untested expert evidence support findings about the need for guidance. Um, the court was clearly worried about the status of the guidance that the court has issued. You know, is it law? Is it guidance? How does it work? What if you don't follow it? What happens next? Um, so it was quite critical of, of the approach the court below had taken. Um, and particularly of the generalizations that were made about the ages that children can consent. 
Um, there was some expert evidence put in front of the court by the claimants um, in Bell, um, but that was very much disputed. And I think that the appeal court felt that this was going against a number of previous judgments, suggesting that you should be very cautious about making generalizations of this kind in the face of the case law, suggesting that you have to make individual assessments of the patient that's in front of you um, and the treatment that's proposed, rather than saying this aged child can't do this or this aged child can't do that. So um, the, the final point to this, of course, is what happens next? There has been uh, an application to the appeal court for permission to um, appeal to the Supreme Court. That was declined. Um, and now there is an application pending to the Supreme Court. Um, the bad news is that um, that will take, probably take quite some time to be resolved. So we simply don't know how long that, that will be. Um, the best guess, though, is it's going, not going to be quick um, because the queue of cases at the Supreme Court is quite long. Uh, and whether this can actually be seen as urgent or not, I think, is, is, is a separate issue. Um, so, so in terms of the process, that, that's where we're up to. Um, it would be interesting to see, as I say, whether we do get a further instalment. Um, but that, that's, that's the, the position so far. So um, just, just looping back and taking stock then, uh, where are we now? Um, you could argue we're back where we started, um, but certainly I don't think the controversy will stop now. And as I've mentioned, there is the pending application to take this on a further appeal. Um, on the slide, I've, I've set out the appeal court effectively reaffirmed Gillick uh, and the fact that it's up to those treating children to make an assessment about the child's competence to provide consent. Um, I do think the court is likely to be cautious in future about similar applications designed to work out what information is required to be understood by a child in order to be Gillick competent. And there's always a feeling that, that, that the risk here was that this case could be uh, the first of a number of cases potentially trying to unpick Gillick. Um, at, on the basis that uh, to try to, to redress the balance as it might be seen and push things back towards parental decision making. Um, the position though in relation to new patients uh, for gender dysphoria uh, is still to be determined and, and there, there are two things particularly to mention there. Uh, the more important one is that there is a review, the CAS review going on um, to try and set policy and, and the court, the Court of Appeal was very clear saying, you know, this is how you should make these decisions by actually having professional investigations and, and setting policy by taking views rather than running test cases. Um, the second thing that's going on is that there is a potential separate judicial review um, in relation to um, the current situation for new patients and, and, and more about that may happen um, in, in the coming weeks. So, so that's 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 Bell. A quick canter through Bell and, and its many sort of variations and different parts. Uh, what I want to do now, uh, looking at the time, is to briefly deal with COVID vaccinations for children. Uh, due to an accident in timing, um, both the announcement, the government announcement uh, about COVID vaccinations for 12 to 15 year olds, and the Court of Appeal decision uh, came out within a couple of weeks of each other, and certainly. Um, if you, you read up, um, certainly a lot of people are suggesting that it was really helpful to have the Court of Appeal move those doubts um, ahead of, of this uh, rollout coming in. Um, I've put this slide up just to mention that, that you know, this is the, this refers to hoax COVID vaccine consent letters being used to try to sort of put people off um, from, from offering uh, COVID vaccines to children. Um, I've certainly seen uh, letters to headmasters as well and headmistress heads generally um, suggesting all sorts of things will happen if they go ahead with 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 offering this. So, you know, there is a concerted, um, there has been a concerted effort out there um, to try to discourage um, schools and others through going through going through the program. Um, but in relation to consent, is there any problem? Probably not, I don't think, because um, although once again we're looking at a controversial and significant sort of uh, uh, situation with lots of opposition. Um, as I mentioned here, the timing of Bell is helpful. And the Department of Health guidance is really clear um, that although parental consent is sought first, if you have um, competent children who nevertheless want to go ahead with consenting to vaccination, then that's acceptable. So this, if you like, is classic Gillick, um, uh, subject to an assessment of the competence of the child 
uh, and of course, um, first of all, um, potentially involving the parents. Um, as a side issue, though, you know, what, what if the parents don't agree? Um, there has been a fair bit of case law um, in, in, in this postcode. Um, and I've mentioned here on the slide, particularly a case called M versus H, private law vaccination in December 2020, which is very interesting. Um, it was a dispute basically between two parents um, about whether they're four and six year old, that they, they, they were estranged, I believe, um, whether they're, they're four and six year old um, should get the standard childhood vaccines. Um, what the court decided was that it was in children's best interest to be vaccinated, a specific issue order before the courts. And the court raised previous uh, uh, Court of Appeal guidance that it would generally benefit, generally the benefit in vaccination as per Public Health England advice outweighs recognised side effects. And there's a very clear judicial message here um, that if there is a gen if there is a recommendation like that, then generally that's going to be seen as something which is in the child's best interest. Um, this case wasn't about COVID-19 vaccination. Obviously, the ages are all wrong and it's way too early. Um, and what the court did was to say, look, you know, we're not dealing with COVID here, but that's not to say that we wouldn't necessarily make a direction about COVID. And the judge went on and said that it was a very difficult to see a situation in which a vaccine against COVID-19 approved for use in children would not be endorsed as being in the child's best interest, absent indications of significant concern. So again, that's a very, very heavy hint that the courts would probably feel that if there is a recommended vaccine, that that was in the child's best interest. So, um, we're, you'll be pleased to hear we're coming towards the end. Um, in terms of problem areas of consent, I said just a couple of points I want to make here. Um, I've just really dealt with parents who disagree about treatment and about how that might need to be escalated to um, the courts if there is a substantial issue. Um, obviously, in that sort of situation, if the child is old enough, then the child themselves can decide. So, you know, in the sense there is a, there is a, a way of working through those problems. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, as I as I raised it earlier, refusal of treatment by a Gillick competent child. Um, what's important to understand is whilst um, a child who's Gillick competent or indeed 16 and 17 year old can consent to treatment, it doesn't mean necessarily that they can refuse. And this case law going back as far as the early 90s, where effectively the court said that um, the court recognises that once children turn 18, they're free to make their own decisions about whether to accept health care or not. Um, but generally speaking, the court's role is to keep children alive until they achieve their majority so they can make that choice. So if you like, if they have a situation where a child um, is refusing care that otherwise could, could lead to um, uh, in the absence of which that could lead to their death or serious harm, the courts may step in depending upon the circumstances, which obviously can be many and various. Um, I put the end on other issues, but to be honest, like I said, I think I'll, I'll, I'll kind of glide over that and move on to my final slide. Um, so um, what's the position? The position is that post bell, Gillick is still very much with us. Um, the decision and the test has been confirmed by the appeal court. Uh, so essentially, whether children can consent is a, is a question of fact and depends on the child's circumstances and clinical issues. Um, we've seen, haven't we, that the court is resistant to adding glosses on this um, or conditions, even in controversial cases like puberty blockers. Certainly, um, the, uh, the test will be applied in relation to whether children themselves can consent to COVID vaccines in schools and so on. As, as to the future, um, well, obviously a lot depends upon whether the Supreme Court thinks that it is time um, to have a look at, um, at Gillick again. Uh, it was interesting, wasn't it, the emphasis the court in Gillick put on how things had changed um, since the court had looked at those issues before. And I suppose you could make the argument that um, 35 or 36 years later after Gillick, that's quite a long time um, and perhaps it wouldn't be a terrible thing the Supreme Court to have another look at that general issue. Um, but for my part, I, I think the important thing here is can we really say that society's values have moved against autonomy for children um, over that period? I think that's a very tough sell. Um, and I think the reality is that actually, um, it, I think it's unlikely the court 
ultimately would want to move, uh, want to do something that looked like it was eroding um, the autonomy of children, uh, particularly given that the government does have, still have obligations, for example, in relation to the UN declaration, etc. So um, that was a, a, a bit of a gallop through all of that. Um, I've certainly think seen one, one or two questions pop up on the, uh, the chat box, but um, if you would like to um, have a think and add anything there, and um, Jess hopefully is still around and can let me know whether we have anything so far. Yes, um, thank you, John. Yes, we've had a question come through. Um, is it right that the decision is currently that the clinician can decide about whether the child can consent to puberty blockers? Basically, yes. Um, so, so, so what the courts decided is that um, after this saga of various court cases, that we're back in the situation where um, effectively it's, it's a Gillick type decision on the part of a clinician whether um, a child of sufficient uh, maturity can understand the issues and give their own consent. Um, it, it's been the practice not to go ahead against the wishes of parents, uh, typically, but ultimately that test very much sits with the child if they are Gillick competent. Uh, one of the things that was raised uh, generally, I think, is that it's not the practice to go ahead with that treatment before children are Gillick competent, and so there was evidence about children and being seen on, on, on a repeated basis um, to review them and to see um, to see how things were going and, and whether they had a sufficient level of understanding. I think certainly some people have described it as, as a textbook uh, type approach to consent, um, although there were, there, there were criticisms raised obviously through the litigation as well. I hope that deals with that and I'm just looking at the other questions. So Jess, you'll have to help me here as I've yeah. not been looking at them because I thought it would put me off completely while I was talking. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so next question, if a Gillick competent child is refusing the COVID vax, but the parent is consenting and wants them to have it, could the vax be given? No. So, so I think, well, let's come on, let's, let's look at the question again. Where is it? Um, it's the second question. Um, okay, sorry. I'm Robert. OK, no, I did see that. Sorry, let me read it properly. If you get a competent, oh, here we go. If you get a competent child is refusing the code of vax, but the parent is consenting and wants them to have it, could the vax be given? OK, so we're into the territory. Uh, it, it, it's a bit like. Um, you, you could, in theory, I think, um, rely upon the parent's consent. However, I think the truth is if the, if the child was refusing, um, then that would be something that would have to be resolved. Um, so you'd need to look at that carefully. Um, so I think in theory you could, um, but the reality is I think if a child of, of, of uh, Gillick competent age, the question then would be whether it's in the child's best interest or not, and that would involve, involve an analysis of you know, whether the evidence is balanced, what the child's reasons were and so on. So I think that one would have to be looked at um, as an individual thing. Thank you. Um... Next question. Uh, can you please repeat the declaration of conflict at the beginning? Yeah, thank you. Now I've got that. Um, yeah, ju just to explain. So, so, so um, our involvement was on behalf of the two uh, intervening uh, trusts who were providing the endocrinology service um, for the gender dysphoria team. Um, so they intervened and effectively opposed the original application by Bell and were involved in the appeal as well. Um, um, okay, so shall, shall I look at the next one, uh, Jess? So, yeah, does the right. outcome of Bell mean that no new patients can currently consent to treatment related to gender dys uh, dysphoria? I think it should be. Um, well, um, in terms of the outcome, that the position is that in theory we're back in a situation where children, new patients, could be um, provided with treatment based on their own Gillick consent. So, so that's fine. Um, what complicates things is that obviously there is also um, uh, requirements that commissioners set out. Um, so in theory, yes, they can. In practice, it may be that certainly after the CAS review, there will be additional requirements that need to be resolved. So I think that's one of those ones that is, is more complicated than simply the question of whether consent can be given, whether legal consent can be given. Um, 
So if, if that sounded rather wheezy, I think it is because it is it is a live issue, I'm afraid. Thanks, John. And um, next question down. Uh, regarding the COVID vaccine in children, as the JCVI has concluded that it isn't in the best in the child's best health interests, but more helpful for the wider community. How does this impact whether it is in the child's best interests? That's a good question, isn't it? Because I think the case I mentioned earlier was very much in relation to um, the normal childhood vaccines where there's a clear basis and interest on the part of the child itself to have them. Um, in relation to COVID, it is more nuanced, isn't it? Because um, it's in part the child's individual interest, but it's also societal issues as well. Um, so I think that you would have to, in an individual case, look at that and, um, when you make your decision. So I agree what's hinted at here, which is it's, it's not as straightforward, I think. Um, but as I say, the court's approach has been that if it comes down to reviewing that sort of situation, they will generally go what's dealt with, with, with the recommendation by Public Health England. Thanks, John. Next question. Um, what are the grounds of appeal to the Supreme, Supreme Court? Are these likely to be picked up? Uh, when you say picked up, I mean uh, agreed by the Supreme Court. Obviously, from the point of view of the Supreme Court, it's got to decide there's a law, there's an issue of, of public importance that needs to be decided. Because on the face of it, we have a previous judgment from the House of Lords, which is you know what the Supreme Court was before. Um, and you'd have to have the Supreme Court look at that again and make a decision on the new case and decide that there's enough of a public importance. Um, I, I, th I think. You know, obviously everyone's got a view. Um, it seems to me that the, the judgment the appeal court was mostly about the powers of the divisional court to make guidance in cases where there's no finding of illegality, which doesn't sound to me like the most pressing of issues of public importance. However, um, it could be argued, of course, couldn't it, that actually what we've got here is, is, is a very important judgment about the abilities of children to consent to very complex treatments, and that given that the main uh, precedent goes back 36 years, maybe it's time to look at it. But as I say, I, I'm just not sure what the impetus is for that. So I think, to be honest, everyone probably has their own view about that. Um, my recollection of the grounds of appeal, um, again, I'm not sure if that's that's necessarily public. I think it probably does get published by the Supreme Court. Um, but my recollection is it, it, it's very much in those two areas. Thanks, John. Uh, we've had a comment come through from Ruth. Uh, very interesting and thought provoking about how much has changed since Gillick within health and our practices with children, young people and families. Thanks, Ruth. Um, Thank next, you. next question. Um, who is liable if there are issues around how consent was taken or it, or it is thought the clinician's decision is wrong? Is it the NHS trust or the individual clinician? OK, well, well, the way that works is that and obviously there's been a lot of, of, of uh, case law, a case called Montgomery a few years ago about what you have to um, get from somebody for informed consent. And it's very much the case that generally speaking, your employer will carry the can in terms of, of, of any liability, uh, civil liability for damages if somebody argues that in fact the consent that you took was inadequate. However, there are also potentially professional issues, aren't there? Uh, and it's conceivable that um, somebody might go off and argue and report you to the GMC or, or the NMC um, on the basis of the self same issue. So if you like, there's a there's an element of double jeopardy here. Truth is, it's very rare for people to go off down the professional route. Um, generally speaking, um, the focus is on 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 the damages claim uh, for obvious reasons. But but that is is a possible outcome as well. Thanks, John. Um, next question. How can a clinician make a meaningful statement about a child's ability to engage in a process of shared decision making over a period of time, um, e.g. discussion over months about hormone blockers prior to referral to endocrinology? Yeah, I think I think I think that's a tough one, isn't it? I think the reality is that it, a lot of this involves, as you say, prolonged assessments and discussions and different meetings. Um, you know, rec records are everything, aren't they? You know, if it's not recorded, it didn't happen. So it's, I think, as much a plea for for good records in terms of recording the substance of conversations, uh, recording the substance of, of responses and, and why at some point it's felt the child has that insight and understanding. 
So presumably the point of having repeated conversations is to make sure that, you know, it's not a one off when you talk to them. Um, you know, it's a bit like um, nowadays, very often when you see contested mental capacity act uh, capacity decisions, you know, it's basically people just write out all the questions and all the answers. So, you know, in an ideal world, you would have um, almost transcripts of the, these conversations. I mean, that's not realistic, but I think there has to be a good quality of, of record keeping. Uh, to enable you to justify the decision that you've made. But, you know, ultimately, these are professional issues, aren't they? It's a question of your understanding uh, and the information that you get. So I think that, you know, second guessing what you think only takes people so far. Thanks, John. Um, next question. Uh, given that Bell was 17 and therefore deemed able to consent, but not refuse treatment, doesn't that make her argument more about the consent process and information included in this given to the patient to weigh up the risks and benefits rather than age? Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the oddities, isn't it? That, um, the, 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 the arguments raised in Bell didn't really apply to, to Bell herself um, because as, as is rightly pointed out here, uh, she was in the age range where she could consent as if she were an adult. Um, you know, to a certain extent, all these cases you know, it tends to be um, the reality is she, she came along after the cases started. Um, and so um, she very much figured at the centre of the, the publicity, but, but I don't think she was around when the whole thing started. I'll just check and answer that. Uh, doesn't that make her argument more about the consent process? Yeah, I think it's a sort of, if you like, a generic argument about the consent process generally for under 16s, not so much about um, her individual circumstances. Thank you. Um, next question. The consent demand burden is one we deal with in real life. Has this been re referenced in the appealing, uh, the appeal ruling? Easy to consent to small things or difficult for complex enduring effects issues? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm entirely understanding that one, to be, that question, to be honest. But if, if um, I, th I think certainly the um, uh, there, there's lots of case law about how the degree of understanding that that, that children need will vary according to how complicated and how complex the, the, the treatment is. So I think that's that that that's straightforward. Uh, the consent demand burden is one we deal with in real life. Has this been referenced in the appeal ruling? I'm not sure I follow that, or maybe that's just me. Um, if if it's a reference to how you know you are going to get um, patients coming along uh, very much wanting. Their, their treatment. I don't know. Maybe if 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 Julie wants to, she's um, she explain. She has just commented now saying that you'd answered her oh, question. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, okay, fine. So sorry about that. Um. Um. So we've had a, a reply to one of your the previous questions saying the issue with Tavistock was that there was insufficient psychological assessment for capacity to co capacity to consent, and that very young children were being subjected to hormonal treatment as per their own internal review? Well, I, th I think that's more of a comment, isn't it, really? Yeah. I, I'm not sure that actually um, uh, fit, fits the evidence as such, but it, but certainly the case, you know, when you look at the figures, there were some quite, quite young children involved in treatment, um, but, you know, each case rests on its own facts. And I think one of the things that, that, that Gilly can and Bell were quick to point out is that, you know, these are individual decisions and we should be cautious about making sweeping generalisations. Um, and, and certainly I think one of the things that will probably come out of the CAS review is is, is, a, is another look at what, what precautions or additional requirements there might be, um, especially I, I suspect for younger children. And then, um, next question. I'm struck by the court's reluctance to lay down conditions for Gillick capacity, given that the court of protection, sorry, uh, given that the court of protection does this all the time. Is there a risk of a disconnect between the two regimes? It almost it almost sounds as though the standards are lower for children than for adults. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, uh, and, and, and I think there's something in this, which is that on the one hand we've got. Um, you know, magically when children pass a particular age, we suddenly then get into a regime where the court of protection is very happy to come up with uh, lists of what information you need to understand in order to have capacity. Um, whereas the situation for, for, for um, uh, under 16s is very different. 
Um, so I think there, there is something in that. Um, uh, however, as I said earlier, I think I think the answer is in terms of the fact that we're dealing with um, a developmental concept rather than a fixed um, uh, ability to, to, to have capacity uh, once, once uh, children become adults. And we're also dealing with a situation where there is very often no underlying mental disorder at all, which obviously makes a difference. Plus, I think that when you look at um, uh, decisions in the court of protection, you know, a lot of those are social care and, and other type issues, not, not medical decisions. So I think it is arguably it's different, but I agree with you that, you know, if you look at this from outside, it does seem a bit odd that we've got different approaches. Thanks, John. Um, next question. What is the danger of assuming Gillick competence and how much information is given to enable consent? The issue is also about professional ability to as assess young children's cap capability to fulfil Gillick competence. Yeah, I, th I think the one thing I would say there is I, I don't think anyone's assuming Gillick competence. I think, you know, very much the emphasis here is on assessments. So, so I don't think you know, we're not in the regime, you know, again, there's a risk here of us bleeding things across from, from the Mental Capacity Act into children. Obviously, there's an assumption with adults that they have capacity to start with, but that doesn't apply with children. So I think you are dealing with, you know, dealing with actual assessments. Uh, the issues is about professional ability to assess young children's capability to fulfill Gillick competence. I think that's a fair point. You know, it's, 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 there may be training issues. There may be issues of recording. You know, very often you see people just say some, somebody was Gillick competent without any explanation at all. Um, so, you know, I think it is, it is potentially something um, that could be a problem uh, and, and certainly there may be training issues. Thanks, John. Next question. What is your view on a child giving consent? Um, sorry, what is your view on a child giving consent to referral to endocrinology? Does this confuse uh, the fact that consent to medical treatment is taken by the endocrinology team? Yeah, I, I'm not sure this is confusing. I think the reality is that, that, that the, um, the evidence that, that appears in the judgments about the process uh, with the JID service is, is that consent is taken um, before the referral across to endocrinology and then the process is, is started afresh and an assessment's made at the endocrinology team about whether they feel that that child is Gillick competent or not. Um, so I think you could, you know, what you may say is confusing could be seen actually as, as, as being good practice because you're getting it repeated and then done by different people, perhaps without the same um, background uh, as, as the first assessment. So I'd have thought that actually points to good practice rather than, than confusion myself. But here I refer back to my earlier declaration. Thanks, John. Um, next question. Is a capacity assessment for over 16s in terms of MCA a good template for assessing Gillick competency for a 14 year old? Yeah, this, this kind of overlaps with questions earlier, doesn't it? I, sort of, yes. And I, th I was struck by looking at the uh, the um, the GMC's guidance that it's very much couched in terms of, of the, the capacity test um, for adults. Um, and, and so, you know, I think there are, there are things it, it's worth looking at the the adult test um, for children to, you know, do, do, do they understand? Are they retaining? Can they repeat it? You know, those sort of things. I think that's perfectly reasonable. But there is a government health warning about ending up with with this, you know, applying the adult test to children. Uh, whereas obviously you've got uh, the, the case law is that it's a factual assessment rather than the sort of thing that's being done with adults. You know, in practice, it may be those two things aren't that different. Thanks, John. Um, we had a question from Helen, but um, she's gone on to say that yep, you've answered yep. it. Um, and then just another question come through. Can we now safely disregard the eight bell points? It's, I think that might be a reference to all the things that you, that if you like, the data set of things that you need to understand. Um, I, I, I think that some of them were very contentious, uh, and I think that the appeal court has pointed out that um, that some of them were, were very much disputed. For example, I think the, one of them was a reference to to treatment being experimental. I'm going to wag my fingers here. Um, so, so I think that you know they have to be taken on that basis. I think you couldn't just say. OK, well, that, that decision's now gone, but I'm still going to use that as my basis for deciding what you need to understand. I think that would be a, 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 that would be wrong. Um, so can we now safely disregard the eight bell points? Um, 
some, some of them have a substance and some of them reflect things that I'm sure do need to be taken up with children to check they understand. But there are some that, that I, I think will be suggested are simply wrong. So it depends. Thank you, John. Um, that's everything that's come through um, the chat box. But if anyone does any does have any questions, please do feel free to um, type them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself as well and ask your question. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a moment for that to come through. Um... Could I just say thank you very much on my behalf, um, Stephanie Ward, one of the clinical nurse specialists at the University College London Hospital. Thank you very much for that overview. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, OK, and we've pretty much run to time as well, which is amazing. Um, so um, thanks very much, everyone. As I say, if you have particular queries you might want to raise separately, by all means, ping me an email. I'll do my best. Um, I think someone's got a hand up. Yes. Um, Maybe that was a mistake. They might have been waving goodbye. OK, that, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. OK, well, look, lovely. Thanks ever so much, everyone. Um, uh, that was really great. Thank you for the questions. They're all really good. Um, and as I say, if you've got colleagues that, that might be interested, let them know that we're doing it again. Uh, it's so much fun this time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.